Imagine a person named Ronald Burnt, an anthropologist who studied these events back in the 1940s. He was probably fascinated by how these people came together, traded goods, and connected without using money, all while respecting their cultural rules. So, imagine a gathering where people from different places come together, and one group is especially known for their special spear tips. At this meeting, the hosts have some really nice European cloth to trade. As a start, the visitors entertain the hosts with singing and a traditional instrument called a digeridu. Suddenly, something fun happens during the dance. Two women from the host side, who belong to a different group than the singers, join in the fun. They give the singers cloth as a playful gift and call them Zamalag husbands. They jokingly tease and playfully push or touch the singers while the dance continues. Then, another woman does the same to the man playing the digeridu, showing their camp's friendly and lively customs during trading events. Now, a strange ceremony called Zamalag starts. Men from the visiting group watch silently as women from their group go over, give them cloth, and even tease and invite them for hugging or touching. Everyone laughs and cheers as women playfully interact with the men, even trying to remove their clothes or guide them away for private time. The men, acting a bit reluctantly, go with their dance partners to a nearby place, away from the bright fires. While at the bushes, men might give gifts like tobacco or beads to their dancing partners. The women then give some of the tobacco back to their own husbands, who encourage these interactions. The husbands use the tobacco to buy time with other women from the visiting group. This goes on, with new dancers joining in, and some men encouraging their own wives to participate, too. Beads and tobacco are exchanged among everyone. Eventually, once everyone has had their fun, a balance is made. The dancers stop dancing and line up in rows, while the visitors stand in line to return the favors they received. It's like a big, friendly, and gift-filled party that wraps up once everyone is happy with the cloth received and gifts given and received. In a special ceremony, men from one group go to dance with women from another group. They pretend to use special sticks, called shovel-nosed spears, like they want to poke the women. But they don't hurt them. They tap them gently with the flat part of the stick and say they've already poked them with their pretend thing, like the way men sometimes pretend to be in love. Then, the men from the other group do the same thing with their women friends using spears with little sharp teeth. This event, which might seem serious or even scary, is actually a big party for the people. It happens because the groups are friendly with each other. What's really happening is like a big fun game taken from the way they trade in another culture, Nambiquara. The people find it very enjoyable, even if there's a bit of excitement and playfulness mixed with their traditional exchanges. When people trade without using money, it usually happens with people they don't know well and might not meet again. They use things like sharing jokes, music, and dancing first to create a friendly atmosphere like when you warm up with a game before starting a difficult task. This helps make trade possible, even though they might not trust each other completely. During the actual trade, people sometimes pretend to be a bit aggressive, as a way to show that they want to protect their interests. It's like a game, a push and pull, to make sure either party feels like they're getting a bad deal. But remember the Gunwingu tribe, they have a different way of doing it. They tie the pleasure of sharing with a playful show of strength, which makes both sides feel comfortable and connected. Now, when we hear economists talking about a world without money, it seems like a big stretch of their imagination. These stories we just discussed show how much more complex an emotional trade can be when we don't rely on coins or bills. Economists, well, seem to not always imagine these real-life interactions and the social dynamics that make them work. Economics as a science emerged with a certain set of assumptions to simplify the way we understand how people exchange goods and services. It's like a game where the focus is primarily on the practical, everyday transactions of buying and selling, not on emotions or life's big events. In the past, for people like the Gunwingu and the Nambiquara, there wasn't the same clear separation between the activities of exchanging goods and the many other aspects of life. They didn't have lawyers or strict laws to handle disagreements. Life was more intertwined. Theft was a real possibility, 
and everyday transactions often involved more than just monetary exchanges. The way we understand economies today, with the market and a separate consumption area, is based on an idea that was created by thinkers like Adam Smith. This model made it easier to study and predict how people would behave in exchange situations. However, this simplified view has become so ingrained in our thinking that it can be difficult for us to imagine life without this division. In short, economics evolved around a worldview that assumes a certain level of separation and order, whilst the complex social and cultural dynamics that were more central to many societies before our current system. Imagine a world where people trade things without using money, like swapping your toy for your friend's ball. In this setup, everyone would need to be super close to everyone else, because to get anything, they would have to meet and trade directly. But life would be so busy and chaotic that it's hard for everyone to know each other well or trust each other completely. For example, the people in northern Pakistan are known for being very generous and welcoming. But when they exchange things informally, they do so mostly with people they see as strangers, whom they don't have deep relationships with. Bartering happens more between people who don't have strong connections like family or friends. Think of bartering as a way to trade with people you barely know, or not close to, because you're not sure if you'll meet them again or how to keep the deal going over time. In these situations, people are careful about what they give and take, as if they're always on the edge of uncertainty, but not necessarily enemies. People often like to trade things, called barter, where they give something they have to get something they want. For example, if you have a radio, you might trade it for another radio or sunglasses. Sometimes, even different things can be swapped, like a bicycle for two donkeys, which can be quite unusual. During these exchanges, people usually do this with people they don't know too well, like neighbors or friends to be, because it's fun to try and find a good deal and outsmart the other person. When you think you've made a good trade and got a better item, you might feel proud and talk about it. On the other hand, if the trade doesn't go your way, you might try to change your mind or trick someone else into taking the faulty item. The ideal person to do this with is someone who is far away, that way, they can't easily complain about the deal later. It's like a fun game that happens between people with a bit of distance. Isn't it tricky when people trade without money? Just like the words for trading in other languages, it used to mean trickery or taking advantage. This usually happens when you don't care much about the other person and don't plan to interact again. When you want to treat someone nicely, like a neighbor or friend, you would want to think about their specific needs and act fairly, wouldn't you?